I'm unmuted. <gasps> I might say something dangerous. That's usually the case. What you didn't see just now as that beautiful opening sequence was playing was my magic opening sequence dance. We got a goofy start for a goofy show today. Actually, no, it's really just another special edition of Adam vs. the Man. Why do we have so many special editions of Adam vs. the Man? Because every episode is special. Just like you. You're all very special. And I know that I'm special because my mom told me that I'm special. Just like everybody else. Now, today is a special show because... My eye is messed up, so it's Casual Wednesday. I've even got the faux hawk up. It's it's not. I didn't. It's like I got. It's, it should be faux hawk Friday for Casual Friday or something. Yeah. Got my, all right, I'll put it. I'll put my. I'll put it down. Fine. All right, we'll back. We'll go back to normal hair. Thank you for everybody who's joining us live today. We especially appreciate those of you who tune in on time. Monday through Friday. Right now, we are starting at 10 a.m. Pacific time. But starting next week, we're going to move up an hour, and we are going to be at 9 a.m. Pacific time and still going for two hours. So get ready for that. Set an alarm. We are going to be live at this time no matter what. No matter what platform sensors, we will find a way. And right now, I'm so grateful we have C.J. Abernathy join us all the way from Meth Dakota as a remote producer making sure that we're streaming on Periscope and Facebook and YouTube. And we've got Comment Jim Freedom in here watching the comments. And you guys know that as with any independent media production, you got to be an active, engaged part of the audience if it has any chance of succeeding. But especially, well, CJ likes to call me the most censored man on YouTube. I think that's, it's nice when someone else says it, so I don't have to be like, I'm the most censored man. It's like the Fox News trick. People say, <laughs> some people say, some experts have said that, you know, according to this stuff or this, but I, know, I love, like you hear this on Fox News and you, there's, there's like, and, and mainstream, all sorts of mainstream news, I, I'll let's do it. It's hilarious when you see these, there are these montages. I feel like we, we should pull one up right now, but like, it's this, this weasel phrase of bad journalism that Fox Anchors in particular, but I'm sure. Like I, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I just, I saw one montage of this, and like, <laughs> yeah, journalists do that, right? People are saying, and you go, people are saying, and you just kind of like launch from that into whatever you want to say as, as a, you know, propaganda piece to manipulate your audience or to get out a, a perverted message instead of saying this is happening. This is so like, but but if you just want to like inject, it, it, it it's a if you're listening for it. It's discrediting, and you go. This is an opinion piece, not, and, and this is this is, and you know what? It's not just that it's an opinion; it's dishonest. It's it's dishonest by the you know my concept of journalism, right? To say, you know, to introduce facts without a source, and when you're you're using it as that weasel phrase, the way they do on Fox News, deliberately. Well, people are saying, or some people say, you know, do you have it already? Did you just pull up the video? No. I'm going to move this so you can see whenever you want to get to it. Oh, we got a super chat. All right. We got a super chat. Yeah, we can interrupt. We're, yeah, we're not. Yeah, okay. So from our guile for $5, Semper Five Brother, liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. And just so everybody knows, yes, Comment Jim Freedom is in the studio today. And yeah, there he is on screen. Watching your comments on Facebook and Telegram. Not Telegram. Well, yes, Telegram. Yeah, separate sure. issue. Watching your live comments, the, yeah, I mean, you're watching Telegram during the show as well, yeah, right? Notifications so on the other phone for that, yeah. we actually have we have five, not on not ten, five, five venues that you can communicate with me during the show through. One, Facebook comments. Two, Periscope com Periscope comments. Those are those are the low value. Jim's getting Jim sees those in the stream of all the comments through Streamyard which has been an awesome platform for what we're doing. And, um, but YouTube, YouTube is what counts because YouTube, you can give us a dollar and you jump to the top of the pile. But also if you're a $5 a month or more Patreon subscriber, if you're a patron supporter of the show, 
you get special access to two other things with StreamYard here. We have we have like like right now. I mean, it's kind of funny because you, you guys, if you're watching this live, and you know, I assume a lot of people are just kind of listening, and that's great. You know, put it on in the background while you're doing your your work, and you know, join us for this conversation. However, is good for you. But you know, I bet there are a lot of people who who are watching or listening right now or in post who just have no sense that there's like this whole backstage. And it's not just, look, I can pull back the curtain, you can see the rest of my bus. Or like, you know, here, here's Jim sitting over here. You, you can see the front half of the bus from his camera when he's on screen. But we have CJ from the command center, the Adam versus the Man production command center in South Dakota. There he is on screen as well. And we also have a backstage area, which is just another cool feature of the way that we're doing this production is that we have like, and, and this is how we bring guests in. And, you know, I in in this Corona phobia drive to everything going virtual, I've been paying a particular attention to these kinds of things. But this is something that's that's always been important to me in looking at the world and understanding the flow of human society. Right. That, you know, you have this virtualization of the human experience. And more and more things going virtual are, you know, you know, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but they're part of you know, the progress of this technology, right? And generally, like, we talked about this yesterday. In fact, I came up with Sam this morning at, at, at breakfast, you know, talking, well, you know, smoking coffee ar around the fire. <laughs> um, but, you know, talking about like retail therapy, like the fact that retail is disappearing. We covered the story yesterday. Something to, was it 25,000 stores? Was that the number? Are, are expected to be closing in the United States this year over the coronaphobia, forced unemployment crisis, and enforced social distancing, all this shit, right? And you go, oh, man, it sucks they're closing down, but the market gets more efficient with people not driving and spending time on shopping inefficiently. And this is different from when you get value out of it and when you enjoy it or there's retail therapy or it's like you, you like trying on clothes and that's how you, you that's part of the process for you or certain things. But you get more resources to go to what you get to you know put your attention on in person and you get to enhance your physical life by digitizing and making things more efficient in general. And what we were talking about this morning that got us on this point actually was uh, the unemployment crisis and. Or the, now this is a huge, like we talk about, you know, strippers and servers and bartenders who are just like, boom, jobs done, gone. Like, and, but then it comes back right now. There's a big contraction in that. But then like you think of all the people who have just made the shift permanently to telecommuting. Well, all of the things associated with that, all of the gas station attendants, the, you know, the, the demand for gas, the, you know, for, for commuting, the vehicle maintenance, those are, those are gone. This is a positive development that we're just being forced to take a little faster. Although a lot of these developments are slowed down by government, like we thought we'd have self-flying cars by now. Well, we, we do, but they're not in widespread use, even though we've had this technology for years. Yesterday, we covered the story in China with the latest prototype of this technology now becoming more and more practical. Um, so it's, it's kind of a delay. Like we should have been doing these things sooner if it wasn't for government subsidization of the commute of the daily commute, right. By subsidizing oil and gas, automotive, um, you know, the, the infrastructure, if the cost of building roads was more built into usage of those roads, people who commute would be paying a lot more and they'd be going like, shit, we need to find a way to not commute. Like this is really wasteful and expensive. And what government does by externalizing those costs, right? By taking them out of the equation saying, well, we're, we're going to socialize the expense through taxes and we're going to privatize the benefit through whatever infrastructure. It, it retards, and I mean this in the most politically correct way, it retards progress. Progress is no longer able to continue at its normal pace because government is slowing it down in all of these ways. So where does that, where does that excess labor capital go? Right, that's, that's the big question right now. Or at least, you know, I, I try to ask the bigger questions on Adam versus the man. Grateful for all of you who enjoy the conversation around these bigger questions as much as I do. So where does that excess labor capital go? If you're an out of work bartender, server, stripper, you know, some, or, or if you're just and you know that your business isn't coming back. Right. 
or whatever it is. If you if you if you're out of luck and you're just I'm yeah, I mean yeah, you're gonna be on welfare. You're gonna get your maybe get your ten thousand dollars a month from Grandma Nancy. We gotta have better. And now that I'm like not just talking about presidential stuff, I gotta have nicknames for other politicians too. Chat question today: What's your favorite nickname for Nancy Pelosi? Um, and where do you think those jobs are going? Where's that? Where is it? Because you, it, it, it's got to go somewhere virtual, or at least to, to, to working remote. Maybe like making arts and crafts at home, being able to retail and distribute them online. Maybe it's an entertainment. If more people, like for the people who still have jobs, how do those of you without jobs figure out a way to plug into that economy? Are you going to entertain them on, on TikTok? All right, we got another super chat from Chris Cole, $5. What's the difference between a cop and a bullet? When a bullet kills someone, you know it's been fired. Oh! Oh, yes! I, I don't think that's an original. Is that original, Chris? I want to know. Like, did, did you come up with that? That's mm, that sounds like a classic. I, I feel like I've heard that, but that's been maybe it's been years. That's yeah. No, I, you know I don't think I've ever heard that before. That's a that's a good one. Yeah, whoever whoever came up with that, congratulations! You just won the internet for today, at least. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so back to the comments. YouTube for a dollar, you can jump to the top of the stack as we just saw. So many great examples of. Thank you for everybody contributing to the show that way as well. But then if you want to get backstage and you want to get into the Telegram chat. So we have the backstage area set up virtually. This is what I was getting at. This is what set me off on that whole sidebar. This is so cool, right? That we have this backstage area. It's it's like it's like right back here. It's like going boom up behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can, you can hang out with CJ and chat directly with CJ and Jim. But you also you're if you're if you're hanging out backstage like today we don't have any guests so we might take some callers if there are people hanging out backstage during the show I know uh, was it was it Matt who was with us before the show I think and um, anybody who is a Patreon patron at five dollars a month or more gets access to our Telegram only group chat uh, excuse me patron only Telegram group chat for Adam versus the man. And it's, uh, it's a way you can message me directly every day. You can put stories in there. I check it you know, multiple times a day. I'm on there multiple times in the morning while I'm doing the show prep. One of the stories we got today was one I saw and I was like, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to cover that. Someone posted in there about the Tulsa cop um, saying that, that, that they don't shoot black people as often as they should. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, that was, we're covering that today because someone put it in the chat uh, with, with Telegram. So be a part of the active and engaged audience. CJ, we talked about moving the show. You got any other producer notes this morning before we jump into the headlines? <clears throat> mm, mm, mm. Let me make sure I'm not muted here. I've been trying to get better at that. Sir. You're good. Uh, <laughs> so real quick, my producer notes again, you kind of already covered it earlier with the, uh, with the time schedule moving, but I had something that I wanted to pull up since I know the numbers and I, I see what, what's going on. So, this is a calculator, and your average video view for a good video right now sits at about 1,500 uh, views of video out of your 241,000 subscribers, giving you with a .00624 viewership out of your subscribers, which means you have more of a chance of dying from coronavirus than actually having one of your subscribers watching one of your videos so yes most censored man on youtube i will stand by that until i see that number increase uh, thank you again you can reach me producer at the freedomline.com uh again i'm going to be scheduling guests out so if you want to be a part of the show uh reach me out there as well as the telegram group i've got uh I've got the ability to work on the calendar and put you in and hopefully get you on the show as a featured scheduled guest. You can send me all the links where you see the freedomline.com right now could be your website, could be your content that you want to bring to the forefront here on Adam versus the man. So also I am looking forward to starting an hour earlier as we start at noon my time. And so, yeah, it'll be pretty awesome, sir. So uh, that's what I've got for today. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, CJ. And it is worth pointing out that what we have here is a beautiful, convenient platform for guests. And if you just, if you want, I will grow the conversation. Like we got two hours a day. You know, I get plenty of time to ramble and rant and, and cover the headlines. Jim? Uh, well, I was just speaking of interacting with the people. There's somebody here that's uh, thinking you're siding with the government communists. And I thought you might want to dialogue with them to clear yourself up. He's saying, I've been here since Adam's days of protesting the Iraq war with veterans. And I never thought I would ever see him side with big government communists. That's yeah, I don't know what, the, what that's what even referring saying. to. His first comment was, if you actually cared about individual liberty and capitalism, you would be defending the small business owners, not the thugs burning them down. Oh, OK. So, you know what? There was this. is This is not the first person I've I've heard confused about the position I took when we did the Blackout Tuesday show from last week. And. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I said I don't support this. Like, I, I don't, like, I, do I have to come out and say, like, yes, I support a small business owner being able to defend their business and not have it violated? No, like, I'm like, hello, uh, I'm, I'm a propertarian libertarian. Like, do I, do I really need to come out and say that? Um, and, and I made the point in a way that I think that there are a lot of libertarians. And I'm going to, this is like, I'm, I'm going to start, I'm going to grab a third rail here about libertarians and racism because there are a number of libertarians who really are on the sort of anti blm side of this because they, like they, they they there's there's a sort of a weird reactionary streak right now where we see racism used as it as it usually is uh, as a divisive political tool, but in a new way now. And I, I, I would, yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm totally with the people who, who are, you know, making making this point that um, the legitimate grassroots anti-racism activism is being manipulated to serve a leftist big government agenda. I would, I would even, but that doesn't mean like. If the Communist Party came out and said, we need to legalize recreational pot across the board so that the state can tax it and, and we can have full socialized medicine, you wouldn't come out and be like, no, we should keep pot illegal so that you can't have cannabis-sponsored communism. It's like, no, no, you have, you have to be able to separate these concepts, right? It's one thing to say communism and another thing to say we should be legal. You know, if you combine those, combining those and the bad thing, that's the problem, not the, the weed should be legal part. And so when I say that, you know, I, I can I can tell a looter, you know, like if you're stealing, you know, like it's and I talked about I use Target as the example. Like it's not small businesses that are that don't have like who's allowed to stay open or who was allowed to stay open during like the whole business shutdown. It wasn't like the, it wasn't the mom and pop shops. It was the essential businesses, chain grocery stores and Walmarts and Targets. Right. And so if, if you're like, yeah, if you're forced out of work and they're they're paying into the system that's holding you down. Yeah. You know, and, and if it's if it's a small the only time I would say it was even remotely possibly justified for a looter or a riot or a protester to go after a small business is if they know that it's one which is sponsoring the police or co cooperating with or encouraging the police as a terrorist organization in your community to, you know, right? Like, and even then I said, I don't support it. I said, it, it might be ethically justified. That doesn't make it a good thing. I didn't say there was the right thing to do, you know, like libertarianism and, 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 eth you know, is, is an ethical philosophy ethics, only prescribes uh, you know a certain line that, that describes human relationships it's not a comprehensive guide to what is good and what is bad so like siding with them no no like saying that they're justified in doing one thing that i actually disagree with yeah okay okay but yeah there's there's this segment of society today that is mostly not libertarian that has these ideas 
of a kind of anti-anti-racism reactionaryism. And it's like, well, there's a white genocide. And it's like, yeah, well, white people face unique challenges to being white people too. Okay, fair enough. You know, or, uh, you know, black people are actually, actually have it better than, than, than whites in regards to police relationships. Like, oh, yeah, okay, you can tease that out of the statistics by some metrics if you want. Well, black people kill more black people than white people because it's all black on black crime. And even black on white crime is worse than white on black. Like, yeah, okay. But, the, you know, like, that that's not a reason to to not pay attention or or ignore the real problem of systemic racism in America. So like in this sense, I'm I'm kind of in between, you know, and um I don't know, I like I like poking at both sides, I guess, to get them to give up their unreasonable position. And uh I knew that I was gonna trigger like Ryan Ramsey. Ryan Ramsey, I think, is the is well, I have I have a few friends. And there's the you call you might there, there might be like described as alt rightish libertarian-ish, libertarian-leaning alt-righters, perhaps. Um, you know, I'm friends with everybody. I'm friends with people from, you know, of all different, you know, ideological perspectives. Uh, so, of course, I'm going to, and it's funny that people freak out. Well, you're friends with this guy who's close to you, but he's also a racist. And it's like, I'm friends with people who are racist and nowhere near me on the rest of my politics. Like, really, like, and I'm not, you know, my friends with racists. I'm not like supporting them being racist or anything. Uh, anyway, did I beat that horse sufficiently to death? <laughs> All right, well, hold on. We, the CJ wants to give me another comment here. John, come on, man. I'm going to be honest. They didn't burn down open businesses, they burned down any business in their path, including small bookstores. Yeah, well, I'm totally against that. I, I never said I supported that. Like, never. I never, ever said it was justifiable or in any way supported damages to businesses that have nothing to do with the police state. Why are you bringing up racism in relation to me talking about communists burning down private property while literally calling for communism? You can be against cops while not supporting commies. Well, I'm definitely against cops and not supporting commies. I'm, I'm doing both of those things. So why, why would I bring up racism now? Okay, so John, now if you're if you're giving a slightly different angle on this, that's great because you know we were talking about, and I, I maybe I falsely assumed that you meant the context of the BLM protests in general. Now, if you're talking about Antifa communists or the, you know those specific infiltrators with that specific intent of just damaging businesses and and causing chaos, and their messages Antifa anti-fascism, I don't support any of that. It's baseless, groundless, unethical from the ground up. Not calling for any kind of legitimate justice. Um, except on, you know, you know, in, in their world, you calling for justice in lots of ways, but not in, in what they're doing, not in calling for communism. So there, I, I'm, I'll sign the pledge that Tom Woods wouldn't. I'm anti-racism. I'll sign the pledge that Nick Sarwark wouldn't. I'm anti-racism-based bully. I'm like, yeah, I'm anti-communism. I, I just, this is, you know what, John? Fuck you. No, oh, uh, shit, I was supposed to, you know, no, 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 really, for bringing this up, because this is a kind of like, you, you know, and I don't mind the question. I'm happy to take the question and, and get into this kind of thing and, and explain my position. And, and, and John, honestly, you know, I appreciate it. But, I, but what you what you're doing is, is a kind of dishonest tactic of like, can I get you to assert a position that sounds like mine by saying, but you sounded kind of like this and making me go, oh, no, I'm completely against that. You know, and it's it's kind of a manipulative way to like to, to bring people more in your direction rhetorically, right? It's kind of like that weasel phrase. Some people say, you know, Adam. Some people have said that you're you're not really sufficiently anti-communism. And now what you've done, like, you no, know, I'm pro freedom. I'm pro freedom. Pro freedom. Pro freedom. And you go, but Adam. Some people say that you're not sufficiently anti-communist. And I have to come out and say, I'm anti-communist. I'm so anti-communist. I, I'm I bleed the opposite color of red. What, you're like I'm so anti-communist. I killed one this morning in my pajamas. You know, like I just whatever. Like, and now I'm not pro freedom anymore. I'm anti-communism. You just took me off my message, right? And we have the space for that. But like, why? Like, no. so on, on a bigger platform or on a, you know in a shorter format, obviously here we're way more casual. We encourage challenging questions like this. You know, we're gonna have more fun with these kinds of things. But, 
yeah, I got to point out that that's it is kind of a weasel, a weaselly manipulative tactic, if you will. Are you really anti-communism? Yeah, okay. All right, to our first story, we go to NBCPhiladelphia.com. New Jersey corrections officer mocks George Floyd's death as protesters ask. CJ, got to play the video on this one. This is, this is the uh, leading outrage story of the day. We're going to pick it apart, take your comments. Uh, go ahead, please pull, pull us up full screen. And let's just do this whole news segment, uh, two and a half minutes. At three o'clock Monday afternoon, a crowd of 60 to 80 demonstrators had a police escort to spread a Black Lives Matter message of unity and equality right here on Delcy Drive. Overall, it was a really great experience in spite of what occurred. Um, what we saw was disgusting. <laughs> What happened next was this, a group of people counter-protesting on private property decorated with Trump signs next to the road, antagonizing protesters. On this cell phone video shared with NBC10, we can see a man kneeling on the chest of another person on the ground. It's not clear why. They shouted that George Floyd should have complied with police and that, quote, black lives matter to no one. It automatically brought me to tears. Darian Fennell organized yesterday's peaceful march when she saw this. I thought about the young children who were marching behind me. I thought about my son and just how horrible and despicable that, to do something like that is. How sick an individual has to be to act in that way. They are cowards. They're losers. And they, if they don't think I deserve a right to breathe, then I challenge them on their right. Franklin Township Police didn't wish to speak on camera today, but released a joint statement with the mayor that reads in part, quote, the Franklin Township Committee and the Franklin Township Police Department are appalled and saddened by the revolting actions of certain individuals after Monday's locally organized peaceful march. This is not who we are as a community. The display yesterday showed me that racism is real, racism is alive, and it's right next door to you. Fennell says she will not be intimidated and will continue to spread a Black Lives Matter message of love and unity. If I touch one heart in my advocacy to try and make a better future for all of us, that's really my goal. Police are continuing their investigation into what happened, and we also tried unsuccessfully to get in touch with the people in that video. As you can see, a small number of demonstrators gathered here today, holding their signs as motorists who drove by honked their horns. Another peaceful protest is planned for Franklin Township this Saturday. Reporting. In so today's asshole of the. Century Award goes to that guy. Yeah. Now, oh, I, I mean, I have a lot of mixed feelings about this because part of me wants to say, well, it's good, right? It's good that we're illuminating what, what, the, the hatred that is out there. Because, like, you know, you can, you know, like, I can look at Black Lives Matter and say, well, like, I support the core message. I support this element and this element. I don't support it as a whole because I'd rather see you know, these issues addressed in, in different ways, but, you know, um, I, there's nothing I would, I would really like oppose in, in the core of the message, which is, hey, Black Lives Matter, implying, hey, in many ways, the system operates as if Black Lives don't matter. Let's change that. And I, I think that's an entirely worthy cause. I support Black Lives Matter in the sense that it's doing something good and righteous and existing. Uh, you know, I think of it as a, sort of um, an ally movement to freedom. It's not the freedom movement. They're not calling for libertarianism, but to the extent that they're calling for justice, they're moving us in the direction towards freedom. That's a good thing, right? And, you know, you might say, but Adam as a whole, they're being manipulated. Okay, well, that's separate. Like, just because you, you know, somebody has a cancer, you don't say that they are a cancer, right? So the counter protest here, though, one, mocking a death. There's there's no excuse. Just absolutely just hateful. There's right. I mean, there's. And, you know, I, I have to wonder, they said in this in, the, in that news report that they tried to get in touch with the people in that video and couldn't. 
<laughs> oh, I feel sorry for them now. Because the people who did this, they probably have, like, I'll bet if you interviewed them. And you know what, CJ? We should try to interview. I want to interview that guy. Let's let's give him a chance. Because no other, every other major media outlet is going, screw this guy. He's evil. He represents everything that is wrong with racism in America. And Black Lives Matter activists need to go find his address and egg his. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if he got firebombed. I mean, considering what is like, if you you are calling for support of violence, there are a lot of people in the black community today who go, "You're actively calling for violence against me." Therefore, using violence against your property is going to be justified. You know, and I I, I don't agree with that statement, but that, I'm just saying that's how a lot of them are seeing it right now. This guy's famous today. The guy from Jersey mocking George Floyd's death, right? I'm sure he's getting inundated of Facebook friend requests, hate mail, you know, phone calls, threats, everything. I'll bet he's like he's in some kind of panic room or isolation or he's freaking out right now. He's probably got he's probably out of his house. Honestly, I bet nobody lives in that house anymore. You can't live there. You can't live at the property where that happened in that video. Right. I would assume not. You can't, sorry. Nope. You can't live there. For now, as long as this is fresh, as long as that video is getting around, human beings cannot safely live in that house. Do you, do you do you abandon it? You know, do you do you post a security guard out front to do what? Like, if one if if, if a mob if the mob <laughs> right if the mob comes and decides that house is getting burned down, it's getting burned down. Sorry, like you. I mean, short of. A, a, an actual line of police. And even then, you can throw a Molotov cocktail over a police line. So, I, you know, I want to, I want to like put myself in the other guy's shoes for a second and, and kind of be sympathetic and think, well, you know, what if you heard this whole spiel of, you know, hey, it's all black on black violence and cops are actually on the whole nicer to white people because of this analysis and this analysis and because they're afraid of messing with black people because this is what happens and so on. And maybe they've been victimized by black people, right? New Jersey, mixed communities, <clears throat> maybe, you know, they, and, and they're not worldly or educated enough or just present to the perspective necessary to not generalize and go, well, these statistics back up my experience that has had black people be violent against me. <clears throat> well, I mean, can you can you put yourself in this guy's shoes for a second? Think what if what if you were the victim? What if he was the victim of a home invasion by black people and his wife was killed? And then he goes down that rabbit hole because it's there. There's that anti-black racism rabbit hole on the internet in the United States today that says it has all these other statistics. And they're, they're, you know, most of them are legitimate, like the facts behind them. Like I'm not saying, you know, I want to dispute that you can in some ways say, I think most of those things that I said that are sort of the pro-white statistics. So that he turns to a symbolic gesture of hate. And he yells, you know, black lives don't matter to anyone. It's understandable. Does this represent a bigger demographic? Have we seen, have we seen this? Is there going to be coming counter demonstrations? Well, in a related story from publicradiotulsa.org, TPD, Tulsa Police Department Major, police shoot black Americans less than we probably ought to. Can we get that audio up, CJ, where it says listen? right under the photo let's let's give this man the full context that his <clears throat> remarks deserve shall we systemic racism in policing quote just doesn't exist and described protests over the police killing of george floyd in minnesota as quote insane and over the top Major Travis Yates of TPD made the remarks in a conversation with talk radio host Pat Campbell posted on Monday. 
He also alleged with no evidence that protests are being financed and encouraged by activists and the news media. Yates also suggested that, according to criminal justice research, law enforcement in America should be shooting black Americans more often. If a certain group is committing more crimes, more violent crimes, then that number is going to be higher. Well, who in the world in the right mind would think that our shootings should be right along the U.S. census line? All of their research says we're shooting African Americans about 24 percent less than we probably ought to be based on the crimes being committed. Captain Richard Muhlenberg, a police spokesperson, said Tuesday afternoon that under TPD policy, Yates has latitude as a division commander to communicate with the public in various forms, including radio shows and podcasts. Is he speaking for himself or is he speaking for the department? The way I interpret what he has said is that he is speaking for himself. Muhlenberg said on Tuesday afternoon that Chief Wendell Franklin was not yet aware of Yates' remarks. Yates has drawn criticism in the past. In 2016, he published essays saying that police were, quote, at war, and that citizens who don't obey police officers should be prepared to die. In 2018, he said disproportionate levels of policing in Tulsa's black community could be a result of, quote, fatherless homes. Chris Polanski, KWGS News. Now... I want to try to see both sides of this. And like, I'm actually taking this from public radio Tulsa. And I, I, you know, it's funny. I didn't expect this to be the theme for the show today. We're we're going to talk about happiness. I promise the title of the show, the value of happiness. Somebody, somebody in the comments, I mean, like, yeah, what's with the title? No, we've got some cool stories uh, that we're going to get to it towards the end of the show today. And we're going to read a little bit from happiness causes freedom and freedom, which I've, I've gotten a lot of requests for. So, but in this, you know, playing both sides, or like, the, like there's this weasel phrase that they used, right? Without evidence, Yates alleged that journalists in a group he declined to name have financial interests in lying about policing. It's like people have said, you know, if I ever want to like relay something that you said and cast doubt on it, Without actually casting doubt on it, I can just use this weasel phrase that is suggesting there is not evidence. So, like, right away, the first time, um, let's see, there were twice in this story. Um, It says, you know, without evidence, I want to make sure I've got it. um, Where is it? They were trying to say that... Without evidence, the ace that journalists in a group he declined to name have financial interests in lying about policing. And then what was what was the other one? Um, without evidence. Uh, let me see if I can find it. I, I, I hope I'm not. Oh, no. There's a, maybe it was alleged. No, there's only one in, in the written part. Oh, I'm sorry. It was in the audio part that you just heard. Where they said, like this example, without evidence, Yates alleged that journalists in a group he declined to name have financial interests in lying about policing. And if you're a casual reader of this story and you're just taking this in, it's it, you go, well, it, it doesn't trigger you because it's not a lie. Yes, he said these things without evidence. But what you're suggesting, the idea that they're implanting, implied by this, is that there is no evidence. There is no data or anything to back it up. I think the other reference in the audio, if I recall, Jim was talking to me about comment stuff while we were listening to that audio. But no, the other thing, if I recall in the audio, was that he said that these protests were being, uh, what, fueled by by paid activists. And it's like, they are. Like, we, we, that's not a disputed fact. Like, you want to, but it's it's like, if, if I want to deny something in the narrative, like, um, I don't, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. Let's say Jim and I get into a fight and, um, you know, I, I punch him in the face and I break his nose and, you know, he sends me an email a couple of days later. Hey, man, I had to go to the hospital. You owe me three thousand dollars to get my nose fixed. And I could say without any evidence, Jim claimed that I owed him money for breaking his nose. And it's like it's truthful because you didn't include the bill and the attachment to your email but like 
It's an obvious thing. And I've just, I've, I've just reframed it. And if you're not paying attention, like this is, again, I, I love repeating every time that this thing about from the Dalai Lama, right? You, you know, what's the first thing you do if you were president? He said, I would call things by their proper name. War is murder. Uh, taxation is theft. Politicians are criminals. Government is a racket. Basic things like that. I'm just using honest language. And in modern propagandistic journalism, we see these kinds of discrediting weasel phrases all the time. Now, I bet the chat's already blowing up. Adam, why are you defending this racist cop? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm exposing where the leftists attacking the rightists, you know, did something intellectually dishonest. Now, let me tell you where the guy on the right of this is also totally freaking wrong because he is assuming this violent racist framing. One that is an officer, he should be looking at things through a racial lens like this. Now, yeah, we, we can argue that. Should you know, would private police pay attention to race? Could you? Yeah, sure. I, I don't I don't care. I get it. The, you know, paying attention to race is not the same as being racist or discriminatory or or bad in any way. But they're kind of like pissed off at him about the wrong thing. Um like this one, you know, without evidence, Yates alleged that journalists and a group he declined to name have fin financial interests in lying about policing. Well, yeah, of course, there are lots of people who are like they, they're all these protest groups. Like if you lie, if they lie and make cops look worse than they are or, you know, and that that usually doesn't happen. They don't really discredit themselves that that blatantly. But if they, you know, lie about an incident or a protest or a killing or, you know, cherry pick statistics yeah are they lying about policing yeah do they have an interest in it yeah because they financially they, they get paid more as organizers to have successful events not unsuccessful events. so what's the real problem with this is the assumption that they should be shooting people at all that when you have the overwhelming force and the budget and all the non-lethal weapons that money can buy, that you can subdue people physically without killing them. The idea that this is, this is an assumed framing. And honestly, as far as police go, what this guy said, not that bad, right? Why am I covering this? Because, well, it's, you know, fun teasing out the intellectual dishonesty in the story, but also, that it, this is this is emblematic of the norm. That what this this is the norm of the modern police paradigm in America, right? That um, you are the unquestioning authority, and that it, it that that killing people is part of the job, not just a, an unfortunate side effect that we should be striving to eliminate. And really, with what we have for non-lethal weapons. You know, I mean, I, I I would love to see the police, just as one simple reform, be more aggressive with non-lethal weapons, honestly, right? You're like, Adam, not aggression principle. How are you saying police should be more aggressive? Well, if they're being aggressive, like with pepper spray, they're being less aggressive with bullets. So it's it's less aggression overall by focusing what they see in the current paradigm is the need for crowd control or controlling an individual to non-lethal instead of lethal weapons. You know, I think in, in general public safety, like I carry, oh, my keys are over there. No, I carry a pepper spray. Like I'm a felon. I'm not allowed to carry a gun. But when I did carry a gun, I considered it irresponsible to carry a gun and not have a taser or pepper spray on you for that escalation of force. Cops have that. Let's encourage them to be, you know, to, to, well, first of all, we should encourage them to de-escalate, but when they need to escalate, encourage them to escalate as little as possible to control or subdue someone who's out of control. And, and of course, you know, if we had the ideal of a voluntary society and no government police at all, and police were actually liable for damage they caused to individuals, to property, things like that, you would have a much greater emphasis on being able to safely subdue and control someone who is out of their mind. And that would be the greatest source of, of criminality would be, you know, mental health issues where people, you know, either have whatever, whatever, you know, rage or, 
you know, other kind of explosive episode that leads to criminal behavior. All right. So the next story, we have another piece of Corona phobia law enforcement texture from San Francisco dot CBS local dot com video Alameda police release body cam footage of black man's arrest for dancing in street. Got to play this one, CJ. This is another where you just, oh my gosh, really? Like, and it's a, it's a white cop arresting a black dude. And you would think at this point that cops would be, you know, a little more sensitive to stuff like this. Um, and, you know, like CJ, can you pull up the video? Let's get this, this full screen. Um, I want to get the timing on this. I mean, the story was June 6th, though. So just four days ago was, was when this video came out and went viral from Alameda. And I know this is a recent video um, because it's it's in the uh, Corona time. So the incident in Alameda happened two days before the George Floyd incident. So here we go. Let's uh, get the audio on this. Good morning, dude. Hey, man. You look like you're having fun. Everything okay? I'm getting my exercise. I never crossed the street. Uh, okay. Someone said that you were dancing in the street and they were concerned for your safety. So I'm dancing in the street. It looked like you were dancing. I was watching you for a little bit. Yeah, it's like a jazzercise type of thing. Exercise. Is there any particular reason you're not doing it on the sidewalk? People walk on the side, walk in, I jog sometimes, I move, I practice, I'm practicing my art while I'm standing behind me like right this. That's just how we stand. That's fine. Okay, you can stand right there, that's fine. So okay if you have to look at that. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, Excuse wherever's me. comfortable with you. Excuse me, I'm comfortable is me continuing the... All right, I just had a couple more questions, man, and then we'll be on our way. Just want to make sure where you're at. Do you feel like hurting yourself today? Have a good day, gentlemen. Have a good day, gentlemen. We just Have require. A good day, gentlemen. No. Have a good day, Listen, gentlemen. at this point you're detained. Understand? Sir, sir. Don't reach for anything. My keys. Right. My car. May I? Green house. No, no. For what? Listen, I'm trying for to be cool. What? Clear. You're dancing in the street. Technically. So what? I'm dancing in the street. Yes. Hold on, woman. You're not free to go. What you're not you free to go. You're not. What free are you to touching? Go. Stand over here. Get your hands off of me. Stand over here. Officer, talk to the. I'm lady. sorry. Talk to the lady. I understand. Alone. Second, okay? Listen, Take your hands off of me. You don't get to no. check. Right no, no, now, no, you're no. in the street. So technically. Sir, sir, I was on the side. Hey, hey, Excuse me. Let my hands go. Miss, we understand. Let me go. Sir. Let me go. No. No, 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 no. Do you have idea Let on you? me go. Why are you touching me? Right Why now. Why are you touching me? Stop asking questions. I Listen. have two questions no, to no, ask no, no, you. No, 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 no. I was walking down the street. Put him over in the street. If you resist, you will be put under arrest. Stop resisting I'm now. Not. Gentlemen, gentlemen, what are you doing? <laughs> Officer! Stop resisting now! Ma'am, could you let these people know that I'm not... Please record. Please record. Please record. I do this every morning. Um, excuse me. Uh, okay, I do this. Let me go! Stop. Get Stop your, resisting get now. Get your hands off of me. Stop. I do. Listen. I have the water. 31. We'll take a cut to your unit. It's, what is your name, ma'am? Oh, you want to copy? Excuse, excuse me, sir. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Stop resisting. Sir, I am not. He's requesting code 3. <sighs> Listen. Listen. We're not trying to fight you. Listen. You have violated me. Yeah, bro, I'm bro, calling bro. my attorneys, blood. That's I'm fantastic. A Good. We'll talk let to me, him. Let me go. We're good. Let me go. Just keep control of him, man. Don't sure. dump him. Just keep control. <clears throat> I'm good. 
Thank you, ma'am. Every morning, I live. That's what we wanted living. to know. Listen, this lady is telling you. Yeah, I told you, get your hands no, you off didn't. of me. Yes, I Stop. Listen, Stop. you are not stronger Stop. than me, so please let me go. Listen, I don't want to let, hurt you. You cannot. You cannot. You cannot. Listen, you cannot. I don't listen, you can't. Brother, you can't. Disturbing. Disturbing again. And this was two days before the George Floyd incident. So what do we learn from this video? Now, you don't want to extrapolate too much and say, oh, you can get arrested for just being black on the street in America. But you can. And anytime you hear these statistics that say, well, look, black people commit more crime. Where do those statistics come from? They come from incidents like this. <clears throat> Why do black people commit more crime on paper now? In some ways, they probably do. Like I and I'm I've seen the statistics where yeah, there's more black on black crime than white on white crime when it comes to violence. Okay, I can accept that. You know, let and say yeah, this is, and I can be a race realist. I can say, look, I know I'm not racist. I'm sympathetic to the plight of black people. One of the realities of the plight of black people is that. As a result of poverty, they're more inclined to be violent. There's more violence in the black community than in the white community. Okay. But when you say, well, black people are inherently more criminal because they get arrested more. <laughs> well, then you, you kind of have to blunt that statistic with incidents like this and say, well, what? Really? You know, because you, you have to look at so many other things to make these conclusions decisively like well it's you know white people have it better in relationships to cops than, than black people and I, I think when you look at the whole yeah it's, it's pretty clear that yeah white people do have a better you know have a privilege in terms of dealing with law enforcement relative to black people and there are plenty of incidents you can say adam but what about uh Shit, what was the other case in California? We talked about the guy who got, uh, the homeless dude who got beat up and, and killed by cops there. Yeah, there's so many names. So many names. Um, so, like, it's not to say that this, this couldn't happen to a white person. But when you see, you know, more videos like this, you know, you see the patterns, you know, you, you, you analyze the statistics from, you know, a, a one level deeper analysis and, and a bit broader perspective, I think it's, it's more useful to understand. The other reason to cover the story, aside from the, the general, you know, racism issues or you know, race and police brutality issues, is just understanding the texture of coronaphobia. Because what you saw in that video, I guarantee you, is happening more now than pre-coronaphobia to both black people and white people, right? Like the woman who got arrested in the park in Utah, although that was a little more of a stage thing. And you know, there was no, you, you know that, you know, the, the cops are going to be a little more kid gloves physically with a white woman with her kids in a park compared to a black dude by himself on the street. Like that's just part of the reality of human relationships. So, Jim, any any comments on all this before we go? We have we have a bunch more headlines to breeze through today, and, and and a few more statements. We got some good news from Seattle. We got all of our happiness stories, but uh, for for the general, I know this is kind of a hot topic, good one for discussion. What hot comments do you have for us so far? Any other super chats? Uh, no other super chats. Nobody wants to spend money to talk about racism. Yeah. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Saren uh, just said Native Americans also experience the highest rates of all forms of police brutality. Yes, so, yes, you know. yes, absolutely. And that's why, like, while I, I support the, you know, I, I support the message of, of Black Lives Matter and the movement in a sense as an ally. Um, I, I think it is, it, it is kind of a narrow way to address, um, you know, the bigger problems that they are uh, you know, trying to address. So, oh, we had another comment there from uh, CJ put up on screen. 
What was that? Oh, just that Native Americans also. Okay, he's just pulling up that one. Awesome work. Can we give can we give Jim access? Or are, are, are you pulling up CJ's the one pulling up the comments from the chat? Can we? But I can get access. We haven't figured that out. Okay, because oh, because it's one computer is the producer that gets to do that. Like, so there wouldn't unless he was letting you remote desktop to his station to click in through his Streamyard login. Although, hey, maybe that works. But we'll figure it out. Yeah, that would be really cool for Jim to be able to, to be the one in control of the comments. But CJ doing a great job keeping up on everything There's as well. One, one more comment I wanted to cover. Uh, it's sort of related to this. It was way back in the feed, so I can't find the name. Sure. Of it. And post it again. Uh, but he just suggested that we should get some First Amendment auditors from YouTube here on the show to talk about. Because they're like on the streets interacting with cops a lot. You know what I mean? So they could have some insights on well, really, what we could do is uh, what what I, I mean. I've seen First Amendment audit videos, and they're they're really good. I would, I would and that there's probably because it was just a, a trend that popped up, yeah. like, and it was. I think I, I'd like to take some credit for building the backdrop to the to the, to the First Amendment audits becoming a thing, and it kind of what it started what like a year or two ago. Is it was just yeah. no, I mean people have been doing First Amendment. Things that were First Amendment audits and unintentionally or without calling it that, and I've done it. I mean, it was it was always a part of my act. Hey, there's cops, or there's a government building. Let's film until they tell us we can and see if they respect it. And you go, what is that? Oh, it's a First Amendment audit. Ah, yeah. Now we have a name for it. You know, that's really cool. And it, it would be there's actually a lot of people that do it now. Like, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's a really like by by giving it that name it was easier for people to imitate right you know, oh i could do a first amendment i was just ooh, that thing where adam confronts cops and and law enforcement security like whoa that's scary but oh first amendment where all i'm doing is asserting my right to record really beautiful i, I don't know if someone's got like a how-to video or a, you know that's got some montages or something like like if i had a team of video editors i'd get one of them on this right now i say give me a you know overview little history and how to what is First Amendment audits video with a lot of other people's work, you know, edited clipped in and clipped in, make a nice little montage and, and highlight. I think if there isn't one, someone should do that. Um, is it really, I mean, to interview, is there, is there like someone who's really emerging as like a superstar of First Amendment uh, audits well, right now? I don't know in the, in the real world. I mean, I know a couple guys that, you know, I've been watching that have a significant amount of followers. One guy with like 156,000. Yeah. And they're always, they're regular streamers, you know. So yeah, and and I like the things they talk about. Like James Freeman is another one you've probably heard of. He's probably the biggest one I know. Of, James Freeman, and he's he's outspoken, and he I love it because he does like he walked up to a cop at a gas station once. Excuse my picture. Well, you know, we we can have multiple guests on the show. Like maybe yeah, we do we do a, CJ. What do you think? You like the, let's do a roundtable segment on First Amendment audit. Why don't we could pick two or three dudes who are doing that and uh, have them select their own clips, you know, have them set up their own clips with CJ and, you know, do a do a, a do a one hour roundtable on, uh, you know, second half of one of the shows next week. Yeah, CJ. So I don't want to like so about this, you, you know, we don't have anybody really in charge of booking guests. And setting up debate. And I, if we had a volunteer step up right now and just say, Adam, I want to be the one in charge of that. Let's do it. I would love to, and and really maximize the value of this platform that, that CJ has built for us to interact with other people live on the show for interviews and debates and panel conversations and things like that. I'd love to host all of it. So, yeah. Uh, any other comments? Uh, uh, Stefan. Was says mentions News Now California and Tulare County Cop Watch. I know both of those guys and San Joaquin Valley Transparency is another awesome one. They're all pretty much yeah. We're, we're gonna work on that. All right. So is and and do we have people in the in the who's hanging out backstage right now? Uh, we got Nick Berryhill. We got Corrine is back there. Nick's gonna be coming on, I think. Oh right, because Nick. Had, well, we had Corrine and Matt on. Right. Like when we first do it, so like yeah, we'll have uh, we'll take a caller today. Yeah. If Nick Nicholas is it uh, Wildberry, uh, Barry, Hill. Barry Hill, Barry Hill, Wildberries. I was thinking Wildstar, like Nicholas Wildstar. 
Um, Wild Wild Barry is a way cooler last name than Barry Hill, but we'll take it. <laughs> um, yeah. So Nick, if you're if you're sticking around, we'll get you on for for uh, you know the last ten minutes of the show today. Maybe take a couple other calls at the end of today's show. So I'm really excited about this next story and seeing the cracks in the dam. This is from CapitolHillSeattle.com. Community news for all the hill. Capitol Hill Seattle blog. Welcome to free Capitol Hill. Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone forms around emptied East Precinct. With update. And now, I mean, this is a really complex headline, right? This is, you go, wait, 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 what is that? So, like, I actually, let, let, let's skip ahead for a second to the next link, which is wikipedia.org article on the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Now, I got to point out, as you, as, as you can see here on, on this graphic, there's, there's this red uh, highlighted part right there at the top that says, this article is being considered for deletion in accordance with Wikipedia's deletion policy. Please share your thoughts. Feel free to improve. Um, you know, I, I hope they don't delete this because this is so cool, but it's this is worth pointing out. And then you see in the, the little blue area next to that on the Wikipedia page underneath it, this article documents a current event. Information may change rapidly as the event progresses and initial news reports may be unreliable. The latest latest updates of this article may not reflect, blah, blah, blah. Now, scrolling down, this is, this is really cool. Now you're going to start, start to see what this is. Why are they calling it an event, not a thing? They made a thing. They made a thing. This is an event that is ongoing, but what they did is they made the event a thing that is not an event, creating this autonomous zone. And you know, whoa, 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 at, like, it, I know, bear with me. It took me a while reading these stories just to understand what's happening. So the first part from the Wikipedia page, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, C-H-A-Z, or the zone, I love that Chaz, it's got a nice little personality-filled acronym there, also known as Free Capitol Hill, is a self-declared intentional community and commune of around 200 residents covering about six city blocks in the Capitol Hill neighborhood of Seattle, Washington. The zone was established on June 8, 2020, after the East Precinct was abandoned by the Seattle Police Department. That's two days ago. The founding of a new political entity out of these protests and riots. What a beautiful thing, right? A lot, All in line with what I've always been talking about in localization, declaring sovereignty, micronations, just opting out of bigger political systems and we don't want to be a part of this. So in the Wikipedia page, they've got the, the, the background, which is so important. Capitol Hill is a district in downtown Seattle known for its prominent LGBT and counterculture communities. The district had previously been a center for other mass protests, such as the 1999 Seattle WTO protest. On May 29, 2020, protests began in Seattle following the murder of George Floyd. After days of protests commemorating George Floyd and condemning police brutality outside of the Seattle Police Department's East Precinct, Mayor Jenny Durkin announced a series of de-escalate interactions, which limited police presence in the Capitol Hill neighborhood. Following a police retreat, citizens erected street barricades and declared the anarchist Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. If you could pull up the picture there, bottom uh, or to the right on the Wikipedia page, you can actually see it says the zone on June 9, 2020, where they actually have the barricades up. Now, obviously, this is not a fully well thought out so much as a spontaneous creation, no less legitimate for being that way, of course. If a group of people or an individual says, I'm opting out and we own this property, I don't want to be a part of your system anymore. They absolutely have the right to declare their independence. That's how America got here after all. So what is this territory? 
The zone is concentrated around the East Precinct building. It stretches north to East Olive Street, east to 13th Avenue, south to East Pike, and west to Nagel Place. The southern half of Cal Anderson Park falls inside the zone, while the northern half is contested. Maps of the territory were displayed on OpenStreetMap and Wikipedia. Protesters concerned about, concerned about the potential for another vehicle attack used blockades and fences to construct staggered barricades at intersections. The entrance of the zone's territory is marked by a barrier reading, you are entering Free Capitol Hill, in homage to Northern Ireland's Free Dairy. Other signs declared, you are now leaving the USA. Now, to what degree in the middle of a city will they be able to maintain their autonomy? There are actually a number of such areas where there are relative autonomous zones already throughout the world. And the bottom of this article list, for example, Freetown Christiana, which is an intentional community in the Danish capital city of Copenhagen. There is a list of anarchist communities that to different degrees assert their sovereignty. And here in the middle of a city, are they able to separate from foreign aid for basic utilities or infrastructure? Probably not. But this is a beautiful thing to say we don't have to respect the very foundation of your authority. We are going to opt out and create our own thing. So back to CapitolHillSeattle.com, the Capitol Hill Seattle blog. The first night in the so-called Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone that is formed in the wake of police giving up the week-long blockade of the East Precinct was rainy and peaceful and full of speeches from activists, agitators, poets, and socialist city council members. I guess whatever the fuck we're doing is effective, one organizer identified as Matt. YouTube, you can't censor me from that. That's a quote from the news. Said over a megaphone earlier, early in the night as police were still clearing the area. Quote, they are going to move up. They are going to get everybody out of here. And we are free to move through these streets and protest and march. Yesterday, we were on 11th and Vine. The day we have victory on 12th and Vine, they tried to stop us. The night brought tense moments, but compared to the previous week of blast balls and clouds of gas and pepper spray, Pike Pine was calm, if not quiet. The county sheriff's helicopter stayed circling overhead until midnight, providing observations to SPD command on the ground and often drowning out speeches below. The only mate so government backed off and things got more peaceful. And the only thing that was still annoyingly not peaceful was the government helicopter overhead, uh, obnoxiously surveilling. If you can surveil with a quiet drone, why send up a helicopter? Like, and again, it's just one of these things that you go, freaking government, really? Why? Like, I mean, Jim has an $800 drone. That he used to like provide amazing footage of the protests in Phoenix when he went down there last week, week before. Jesus, been a while. Yeah. yeah, wow. Time flies when you're having fun out here at the garden. But why, why do something that's more expensive, more dangerous, requires more manpower? Well, for all of those reasons, they want things to be more expensive, more dangerous, and require more manpower because it justifies their budgets, their power, their control. And it kind of lets you guys know in the chaz, Big Brother's still watching you. Or as Jim might refer to him, the punk little brother, right? Uh, the only major reported conflict came when a TV news crew for the local Fox affiliate was temporary, temporarily chased from the scene and took a refuge in the nearby fire station. The surprise pullback of SPD riot police National Guard troops came together quickly Monday afternoon after a day of hastily clearing out equipment, moving trucks, and reports of a mobile shredding unit at the building at 12th and Pine that is home to the East Precinct headquarters as well as department office facilities. 
Quote, the decision has been made to allow demonstrators to march past the East Precinct later today. An announcement sent to department staff about the decision to close the building red. Additional measures are currently underway to enhance our ongoing efforts to ensure the security of our East Precinct and provide for the safety of all our officers. So there was a withdrawal of the increased presence, a withdrawal from one building, and the people there protesting said, all right, screw it. We're going to be sovereign and autonomous now. Amazing. I love it. And I, you know, I wonder if this is going to become a, a sustainable pocket of autonomy. Obviously, the police aren't leaving them alone. It's not like out here we can we can say this is this is my I didn't mean to point to that. I've been out here out here at the Garden of Freedom. Like we can point to like Adam owns this land. It is his property. Law enforcement is not welcome here. You're going to have to force your way in. Right. Can you really do that with a, a big chunk of downtown Seattle and expect that SPD is going to leave you alone or that the county isn't going to keep flying helicopters and say, no, you're not really autonomous. But if you say, well, screw the city, screw the county, screw the state, screw the federal government, we're declaring ourselves autonomous. To what extent it will be respected, we don't know, but we will demand that it be respected. We'll keep our expectations low, perhaps. I wonder if this is sustainable, right? Because obviously this is being driven by a lot of energy around the protest. This is being driven by the immediate circumstances with coronaphobia, with George Floyd and riots and protests all over America. Is there a sustainable community here? Is there a pocket uh, of people who really want to maintain this border and assert it to differentiate themselves from the rest of the corrupt governing structures in the United States. I don't know. I hope so. The pullback and boarding up of the precinct follows a Sunday night conflagration described by many as the most aggressive show of crowd control power, firepower, yet by SPD that came only hours after Mayor Jenny Durkin after a Mayor Jenny Durkin speech on de-escalation. Monday night, Durkin remained silent on the development of the precinct until late into the night. At 11.20 p.m., some seven hours after Chief Carmen Best held a hastily arranged press briefing outside the facility, the mayor tweeted that the retreat is an effort to proactively de-escalate interactions between protesters and law enforcement outside the East Precinct. Yes! Yes! This is what we need! Proactive de-escalation! Fire the cops before they can escalate anything! Yeah, uh, defund the police. Sounds like proactive de-escalation to me. Keeping as Durgan said, keeping demonstrations peaceful must be a joint effort between our community members and law enforcement. I am hopeful that tonight with these operational changes, our city can peacefully move forward together. Now, this is see, this is why I really hate the property destruction being mixed with protests. If you're gonna do righteous property destruction, like do it covertly, you know, do it monkey wrench gang style. Don't go out and like if you go next to a loud protest and a bunch of cops to start throwing like you're asking to get arrested. You're not doing it as thoughtful pro, you know, property destruction and, and encouraging violence and conflict with police is never helpful. So why would, would you, you know, think that with it, without that, clearly police are the aggravators here. And even with that, the amount of violence that we've seen in protests has been more caused by police than rioters on the whole. Certainly the violence towards people. Maybe you want to say not to property. But we've seen videos of police destroying shit too. Slashing car tires. Busting out windows. So, again, you know, you get government out of it, things get more peaceful. So, the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods, meanwhile, sent an ominous sounding message to area businesses and organizations that warns of a credible threat to burn the precinct building down, notifying them that the building and nearby apartment buildings were to be assessed for possible treatment by, with a biodegradable foam fire suppressant by the Seattle Fire Department as a preventative measure. So Tuesday morning, 
The first morning brought a new configuration to the streets. The police barricades and walls left behind provided protesters the resources they need to create their own path through the neighborhood. Barriers have been dragged into a zigzag maze to block traffic from passing. So they created a barricade system to limit or eliminate uh, vehicle traffic. That's kind of a cool premise for an inner city autonomous zone. It's a vehicle free area or motor vehicle free area. Tent shelters have been put up to help keep volunteers dry at the edges of the core around 12th and Pine. I guess it's like, you know, you put enough people out of work. What are they gonna, they might just organize against you, create their own communities. Above the walled off entrance to the building of the police department for the third precinct, the sign has been spray painted to now read Seattle People Department East Precinct. I love it. I love it. So where does this go? Politics, not umbrellas. Instead of umbrellas, water bottles and rocks, Durkin and SPD officials instead are now facing political threats. Quote from District 3 representative and longtime Durkin critic Shama Sawant uh, in her time at the microphone at Monday night's rally said, what we are seeing now is an uprising, a rebellion of young people, not just nationwide, but globally. Two years ago, there was a police contract up for the vote. It was a bad contract. It was a racist contract. It was going to roll back the limited accountability measures that were hard fought for by community members. And the community spoke with one voice and pleaded, pleaded with Mayor Durkham and the city council, please vote now. What do you think happened? I was the only no vote on that contract. We have to remember that what built the movement is not people who are in power that may look like you or me, but it is people who have shown through their actions that they are in solidarity with ordinary people in marginalized communities. Now, while obviously there is a trend towards a certain kind of leftism here of anarcho-socialism, anarcho-communism, perhaps among a lot of these communities, you have to accept that some of them are doing so under the umbrella of voluntarism, and perhaps of their own concept of how they would untangle the knot of unjustly acquired property that we live in today. But these are people who would, you would certainly want to include in the bottom unity concept of voluntarism and say, look, if they're saying we're not going to force our concept of socialism or communities on anybody else, we just want to encourage people to opt out community wise. These are the best kind of allies that, that we could have as libertarians, even though they are in many ways distinctly leftist. If they adhere to the same you know, ethical premise of voluntarism that, that is behind libertarianism, then it is absolutely essential that, that we, you know, actively support this because what they are doing is asserting their sovereignty for whatever system that they want. And I'm reminded of a couple of quotes. First, MLK, who said something to the effect of an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. and while there's not in, in the sense a literal truth to that, there really is literal truth to the idea that if you commit a crime against someone and you're a stranger to me and the other person's a stranger to me and your quality of life is reduced or theirs is because they're the victim of a crime. And as two people on the other side of the planet, perhaps your productivity is reduced because you resorted to unethical behavior instead of cooperative behavior. I'm a victim too, not directly, not in an ethical sense, but in, in, in the abstract sense, I'm a victim in that I live in a less vibrant world as a result. I live in a world where, you know, my ability to trade as a capitalist and engage with people over the rest of the country and the rest of the world is, is now reduced in quality. We all suffer. We all live in a less vibrant world because of institutionalized unethical behavior most commonly manifest through governments around the world. And I'm also reminded of the famous Pastor Niemöller poem, right? World War II, you know, first they came, 
for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the communists, and I did not speak. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then when they came for me, there was no one left to speak. Well, for everybody who is speaking for their own sovereignty, I hope we can hang together so that we don't hang separately. And when the rest of us see the opportunity to create our own autonomous zones, that we are standing together and supporting each other, regardless of what the flavor of that new voluntary, intentional, autonomous, sovereign unit might just happen to be. I hope that was fun, giving people a window into this new development. But we do have some more negative developments to cover as well around coronaphobia, where we find ourselves today. From the Daily Beast, everyone who's lost their job during the racism reckoning of 2020. And of course, this isn't an exhaustive list. They, there couldn't be. And, you know, I'm thinking of the, the Me Too reckoning as well. You know, how many people lost their jobs because, oh, well, no, standards are higher now if you don't bow down to the politically correct line of the Me Too movement in every way, you might lose your job, even if you're not sexist, even if you're not a predator. And it's the same thing now. If you're not appropriately sensitive, you might just lose your job. And I've actually been following this, and I'm kind of glad that it came out with this story from the Daily Beast, because I saw this first a few days ago. If you mind skipping ahead there, CJ, to Forbes.com, Reebok and athletes cut ties with CrossFit over founder Greg Glassman's George Floyd tweet. And I'm like, whoa, wait, <laughs> what? Now, first, bigger cancel culture issue here, right? Well, you were if there's outrage, we're just going to disassociate. And it's, I'm all for this as a mechanism and the development of this, the expectation of people saying, we don't like what you're doing. We're going to peacefully disassociate is a huge improvement over let's get daddy Trump and big government to come in and put these people in, in the place that we want them. And of course, then what happens is we all end up in the place that government wants us, which is where its corporate sponsors want us. And I, so I looked at this tweet and I'm like, wait, what was the tweet itself? And they link to it. And it's like, it was two words. Go, go the, the prior link there, if you would, CJ, is the tweet itself. So the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation tweeted, racism and discrimination are critical public health issues that demand an urgent response. Hashtag Black Lives Matter. Read our director statement. Health data. Can you pull this one up, CJ? It's the Twitter.com link directly to that tweet. And it's and, and then the graphic associated with it there is racism is a public health issue. And right underneath it, you see the response from Greg, Greg Glassman. And it's just, it's Floyd 19. And you're like, wait, well, wait, that's that's all he said. Now I'm I'm a, like, is it is it insensitive? Like, not even. Is it like I guess for people who have have, have, have take these names of, of every victim of police brutality as as something sacred, um, okay, it's slightly inoffensive to the hyper politically correct crowd. Screw them. But what's the point that Greg is making here, saying it's Floyd and 19? Now his follow-up tweet is your failed model quarantined us, and now you're going to model a solution to racism. George Floyd's brutal murder sparked riots nationally. Quarantine alone is, quote, accompanied in every age and under all political regimes by an undercurrent of suspicion, distrust, and riots. Thanks. Now, not the clearest communication, but again, he's challenging the authority, saying like, well, you, you, your, your COVID response failed. Why should we trust you with the response? To, to George Floyd. That's the comparison he's making. Like I, when I read him saying it's Floyd 19, I mean, because I know that the coronavirus is a hoax. Not that it's not real, but obviously everything around it, the manipulation, the blowing up of the threat. Yeah, there, it's a hoax. And, you know, 
when he says it's, it's Floyd 19, he's, what he's pointing out is that the George Floyd protests and all of this right now is, is, is similarly a hoax. Now, here's the thing, you know, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation puts this out and says, you know, racism is a public health issue. Maybe, maybe Greg Glassman knows something else that there's someone behind this that some, but he probably also knows that this is a fabricated crisis. Why is it happening now? Why did it happen with Eric Garner? Is it just because, well, everybody's all, you know, sensitive because of, because of Corona and feeling shut in and eager to protest. No, it's because the mainstream media made this a story and has been promoting this and encouraging it. So for him to point out that there's a parallel, totally legitimate. Here's where it's really insensitive. And here's the, the worst thing I can really say about his tweet and, and what it's in response to. It's like, again, and I made the point about Corona. I'll make the same point about George Floyd. Just because people shouldn't be worked up about this right now doesn't mean that they're not worked up about it right now and that you should be sensitive to the fact that they're worked up about it right now. And you don't yell at someone who's afraid because government made them afraid of Corona. You dumb sheeple, how dare you put on a mask and then bully me into social distancing? You asshole. I had you. No, like this person is scared. Like, hey, man. Look, they're lying to you. Calm down. This is not something to get worked up about. Let's have our cool, calm, collected, reasonable adult conversation. And hopefully you can put the thing they're trying to get you to be afraid of in perspective. And, you know, you can not allow yourself to be manipulated and learn from it. And next time, be more like me and less like all these other followers who are going along with you know, their own oppression by mind into the fear. You see how that's like a, a, a way better response, right? Someone comes to you in this context, goes, oh my gosh, George Floyd, it's time to be worked up. Black Lives Matter. I want to do something about this now. And you go, <laughs> right now? <laughs> this is bullshit. You're an asshole. You might be correct, but you're an asshole. Now, to the bigger cancel culture thing here. Did someone point this out to Reebok? You know, and again, back to the Forbes story. Reebok has led the charge of brands and athletes cutting ties with fitness firm CrossFit after founder and CEO Greg Glassman controversially tweeted it's Floyd 19 in response to a tweet about racism being a public health issue. And like I said, when I read this, I'm like, wait, wait, where, where's the tweet? And I see it's Floyd 19. I'm like, uh, where's the rest of the tweet? What, what else? That was it? That was it. You guys are two words. Making kind of an abstract point. And you guys are freaking out over this? He's not. There's so many more offensive things that white people have said in reaction to George Floyd and BLM becoming a big thing again than this. Way more offensive. So was there some outrage in cancel culture? Yes, absolutely. But here's what I want to point out and, and getting back to the bigger story. You know, and, and let, well, for, but first, let, let's check in with Axios again here because CrossFit, uh, prior article there linked for, for you, CJ, from Axios.com, CrossFit faces mass exodus after CEO's controversial George Floyd tweet. Now, I kind of want to like de-emphasize the inflammatory headline, mass exodus. Hello, CrossFit gyms have been shut down for the last few months anyway because of Corona. This was a business, I don't want to say on the ropes. I don't know how much, you know, because CrossFit is a national brand that licenses that style and, and, and certifies trainers to, to, to oversee CrossFit classes and they get a cut. You know, are our, our, our gyms like still having to pay their dues to CrossFit National while they're shut down and not allowed to make money off of that? Could it be that they're going, wait a second, why are we paying for this brand? And in a lot of the discussions I've seen in the, you know, the CrossFit community and the fitness community around this story, like we still love the CrossFit training concept. You know, this got me thinking here, like, I'm not a CrossFitter. I'm too lazy. I like to lift weights, <laughs> you know? And then it's like, well, I guess when I'm when I'm doing field work and construction the way I do it out here at the garden, that, that's my CrossFit. I love it. I work till I get winded and, you know, out of breath and take breaks. And anyway, I, so they're saying, like, we're not abandoning the model, but we don't want to pay for this brand anymore. What are we getting out of this brand? You know, or can we 
can we separate the brand from the company and not pay for it? Can we make it an open source thing and, and call it something else? So it's kind of cool to watch the re So like in a sense, I'm for this, uh, getting away from CrossFit in terms of economic efficiency. Do we need a national brand that every gym is paying a cut to? Or could we could, could CrossFit have started instead as a an open source community thing? Could could this guy Greg instead of launch could he have just hosted and he would have made a lot less money in the short run, but he would have created something more valuable for humanity, possibly that he wouldn't lose. Because it looks like now he's gonna lose his business. Right. And he could have like if it wasn't for this bullshit happening now, perhaps he could have transitioned. Perhaps he could have adapted. Perhaps he could have created the CrossFit Council because there's the CrossFit Games and like this is a huge business now. You know, good for him for creating something that enough gym owners saw value in there being that national brand for. But your national brand could have been better. It could have been more valuable as a little more of an open source thing and saying, I don't own the CrossFit brand. I own CrossFit.com. And here we have a community and I'm just the manager of this site and I get paid ads and commission. And I'll charge gyms, you know, premium to have ads and membership and be on my email list and blah, blah, blah. But you could have gone one less level, you know, taking advantage of intellectual property and corporatism as the general paradigm. And you would have had not only a more efficient, more sustainable model, but it also would not have been prone to this kind of cancel culture bullshit that, that, that the CEO is facing now. So I'm against the way that it's happening, the reasons that it's happening. I'm for this, the, the, the transition and efficiency because it leads to you know, greater efficiency in the fitness industry as a whole. And in this episode, the, the, the thing that I wanted to point out more importantly than anything else was that there's this undercurrent of desperation, right? Why are these gyms so eager to be like, it's true, Greg and CrossFit National or International. Screw the, 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 the business. We can do this ourselves. For them, the, the tweet is kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back or the, the, the breaking point or maybe more, more accurately the excuse, the stimulus, the spark for them to go, this brand thing, we're not getting what we're paying for. And now with the additional cost of having to defend the, you know, Greg's racist tweet comment. All right, maybe, maybe we're out of here. And so we go back to the story from the Daily Beast. In the days after George Floyd's tragic death, protests erupted in over 350 American cities. The National Guard was deployed to 23 states and more than 14 metro areas implemented curfews. For more than two weeks, protesters have taken to the streets, sometimes several times per day, demanding justice for Floyd's family, police defunding, and a comprehensive reimagination of public safety. But as the civil unrest played out in public, it has also migrated into the workforce. In the past 15 days, workers at media institutions, sports franchises, TV shows, and food chains, as well as online critics, have forced companies and corporations to confront charges of racism overhaul their hiring practices and interrogate out places from the New York Times and CrossFit to the grocery store Holy Land might find ways for reform. More than once, this has led to oustings and resignations. So here are all of them so far, and I'm like they're way more love less noteworthy quality that are not included in this list. But number one, Greg Glassman, founder, CEO of CrossFit. Obviously we covered that. Next, Wendy Melsey host of The Weekly with Wendy Melsey on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. In preparation for an episode on Black Lives Matter and racism coverage in the media, Mesley used a word that should never be used in a statement given to the podcast Canada Land. Mesley elaborated in the context of an editorial discussion about current issues regarding race, I used a word that should never be used. It was not aimed at anyone. I was quoting a journalist we were intending to interview on a panel discussion about coverage of racial inequality. Can you guess what the word was? A CBC spokesperson told Canada Land that Mesley had been removed from her position pending an investigation. She apologized to her coworkers immediately, adding, quote, I was careless with my language and wrong to say it regardless of my intention. I hurt people, and for that I'm very sorry. I'm also deeply ashamed. Do you fire someone because they occasionally have a slip of the tongue that is not in line with their general pattern or their intent even in that communication? How ridiculous. 
ridiculous is is this sensitivity now like this is this is not you know a, appropriate cancel culture this is cancel culture out of control adam rapaport editor in chief bon appetit because he and and again this one um uh, because he was wearing puerto rican brown face he dressed up as a puerto rican for halloween you know like and you know it wasn't hateful it was like you know it might have been insensitive but like cultural cross-dressing for halloween you know you're gonna do the good and the bad and make fun of stereotypes and i'm, I'm all for uh i hate to mentioned Carlos Mencia, you know, but his kind of racial comedy. Like you can be, you, we need to be comfortable talking about racial differences and being able to laugh at them and say, yeah, there are good things and bad things and things I don't like and things I like about different races. That's not racist. Does it to, to acknowledge that races have differences and that you have preferences that are related to those differences. Like, let's talk about those things. Let's be realistic. Let's do it with love and good humor. And that's one thing I think Carlos Mencia uniquely and someone's going to go, what about this comic? Yeah, hey, you got better comics. Let me know. Uh, but, yeah, I think Carlos Mencia like, was, was kind of the biggest comic of recent memory who really embodied positive racial humor. And, and I think it's great. And, and when people just like this, you know, they're totally ridiculous out of context, leads to firing. Uh, next one, Christine Barberich, top editor, co-founder of Refinery29, um, which I'd never heard of. Uh, Vice owned fashion outlet, apparently, uh, as she said, I worked at Refinery29 for less than nine months due to a toxic company culture where uh, where white women's egos ruled the near non-existent editorial processes. One of the founders consistently confused myself and one of our full time front desk associates and pay disparity was atrocious, atrocious. Um, Hartley Sawyer, actor in The Flash. Uh, let's see. Sawyer's Twitter account has been deleted. So he was making light of racism and sexual assault. Apparently, the only thing making light of you can't you can't make fun of stuff anymore. The only thing keeping me from doing mildly racist tweets is the knowledge that Al Sharpton would never stop complaining about me. Elsewhere, he wrote, "Someone incoherently date rape myself, so I don't have to masturbate." Uh, you know, like is is am I gonna parse out every one of these? Is there some you know, anyway, is there some ill intent? Probably. Do I care? No. In regards to Mr. Sawyer's posts on social media, we do not tolerate derogatory remarks that may target any race, ethnicity, national origin, gender, or sexual orientation. So I apologized on Instagram. I am ashamed that I was capable of these really horrible attempts to get attention at that time. I regret them deeply. Person, James Bennett, editorial page editor of the New York Times. This was a really weird one because they ran an opinion piece from a U.S. Senator, Tom Cotton. Now, unless you're challenging the premises of America's electoral system as a whole, uh, we're talking about a U.S. Senator who ostensibly, under the allegedly under the current system, represents the will of the majority of the voters of his home state and has a vote of one of 100 in the United States Senate. You're not going to give him a repeat, you know, like his, his common practice because it encouraged the use of military force against protesters called send in the troops. Can you disagree with it and still say that a senator, like we can publish it? Yeah. what? But no, this created some whole, like, and, and the thing that bothers me most about this really is the diversion of attention from worthy topics to bullshit sensitivity. Stan Wicknowski, top editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, because they put up building, Buildings Matter too as a, as a headline. And, like, you can't just apologize. Like, there's, you know, read the story. There's no, like, evil intent. They're not saying, you know, black life. Can, can you be insensitive by accident and forgiven? And say, oh, yeah, my bad. I'll learn from that. I'm not going to do that again. I'm still the best person for this job. I'm going to keep doing this. Well, if, if, if we could make that the expectation instead of, well, you can get someone fired if you have a negative tweet storm about them, you know. Alexander Katai, midfielder to the LA Galaxy. 
you know, there's Andrew Alexander, CEO of Second City. Holy Land CEO's daughter, Leanne Waddy, because uh, she was the catering director at Holy Land. You know, and I mean, some of these, like, are are justified, some are not. And they, 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 they just keep going and going and going. But my bigger point that I want to make in, in light of all of these stories and, you know, cancel culture being kind of out of control is that it's it's really important today in a, in a time of crisis like this, in a time of heightened sensitivities, to be tolerant. And I mean that not just, well, we have to be intolerant against intolerance so that we can have tolerance. No, like really, calm the hell down. Like be tolerant. Be to like people are people are stressed right now. People are desperate. Be compassionate, especially when you're you're looking at at, at cutting ties. You know, like with CrossFit falling apart so rapidly right now. Why? It's because people are desperate financially. And I would say that in times like this, it's again all the more important that we hang together and increase our tolerance of each other and support for each other in building and maintaining positive community and business relations because if we allow ourselves to be further divided and economically disadvantaged by cutting ties it's going to further suppress the economy and it's going to make it easier for them to divide conquer manipulate exploit so please be very cautious of that don't contribute to cancel culture you know, unless there's with stuff like this, no, they're they're real injustices to address. There are better things to do with your time, but please be very cautious, especially right now, when it comes to being tolerant and maintaining rather than destroying relationships in ways that you're probably going to regret later. All right, we didn't get to Camden today. We're going to skip that. Uh, we're going to skip talking about real estate. We're going to skip talking about rookie cop um, Thomas Lane potentially being a sympathetic figure in the killing of George Floyd. Story we are going to cover from APNews.com. Chaos in Georgia is messy primary a November harbinger. The longstanding wrangle over voting rights and election security came to a head in Georgia where a messy primary and partisan finger pointing offered an unsettling preview of a November contest when battleground states could face potentially record turnout. Many Democrats blamed the Republican Secretary of State for hours long lines, voting machine malfunctions, provisional ballot shortages, and absentee ballots failing to arrive in time for Tuesday's elections. Democrat Joe Biden's presidential campaign called it completely unacceptable. Georgia Republicans deflected responsibility to Metro Atlanta's heavily minority and democratic controlled counties while president donald trump's top campaign attorney decried the chaos in georgia it raised the specter of a worst case november scenario a decisive state like florida and its hanging chads and butterfly ballots in 2000 remaining in dispute long after polls closed meanwhile trump biden and their supporters could offer competing claims of victory or question the election's legitimacy inflaming an already boiling electorate so pretty safe prediction here to make that things are going to be a little messy in november at least and by that we mean that there is going to be some controversy there is going to be disputes in the election results just like we saw in 2000 bush v gore the hanging chads in florida in the supreme court case bush v gore we might have an election decided by the u.s supreme court rather than the American people, as if that was ever the case. We might have uh, a situation where Donald Trump is able to declare himself president indefinitely until we are able to hold a proper election. So buckle up. Things could still get very messy. Want to go to freedomsphoenix.com real quick here, if you could pull that up, CJ, to point out a couple headlines. Always worth checking out, freedomsphoenix.com. Um, newborns. To be separated from parents for COVID-19 testing. Yes, another scary possibility on the horizon based on comments from Bill Gates. Um, underneath that, BMW invests in technology to pull gasoline out of the air. This is so exciting. This is a technology that I, when we started talking about 3D printing, 
Um, and I had like Jim and I were talking about this last night. Remember when I, I was telling you we got a like a four five hundred dollar three D printer in two thousand eleven. I think it was called MakerBot. It was, it was the brand. It was a you know, pretty cheap plastic, and it spooled plastic and melted it, and 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 you know put it in design, computer controlled. Bit of a pain in the butt to control. But I was thinking, okay, so if we can three D print everything, where you know where are we going to get all this plastic? And, you know, oh, we can recycle, right? We can take old bottles. And melt them down into spools, at least. And, you know, like if you think about all the plastic we're saving here, right? Maybe someday we'll have, the, well, we have the technology. Maybe someday the technology will be convenient well, enough yeah. that an individual house or homestead could do plastic recycling on. So imagine that. Like, really, that's the comprehensive machine is that you, you put in your used plastic bottles, your old plastic whatever. Like, you can 3D print a toy. You're done with the toy. You throw it back in the plastic recycling hopper. And it melts it, reprocesses it back into a spool that you can use to print the next thing. But the next level, and you know, I, I, I think about that idea I got from my friend Quinn Aker that you can have a floating barge. Remember that we covered the floating energy barge that could be used to clean up the plastic island of garbage in in the ocean, right? And you can recycle that plastic if, even if you're just combusting it and turning it into you know some kind of pollution. And hopefully, it's like you know neutral pollution like um you know co2 as opposed to like toxic chemicals of burning plastic right no yeah i get yeah i'm not dumb there are problems with co2 pollution i get it but uh the next level of this technology is oh shit we have pollution in the air well what happens when we suck the pollution out of the air you can use it and if imagine if we had like a solar powered device that just runs air through it and every molecule of fossil fuel whatever exhaust is reabsorbed right so um scrolling down there's just some cool more some other cool articles here i, I just want to do a couple quick technology updates from freedomsphoenix.com each spacex starlink satellite has over 60 computers a starlink constellation has more than 30,000 linux linux nodes more than 6,000 microcontrollers in space right now. Um, I mean, they're just seeing what's possible. Uh, the next one down, your folding PC future is almost here. Intel launches Lakefield CPUs. You know, it's just, um, it, you, I, I love staying on this, not just for its own sake, but when you see the technology that's out there that is not fully implemented because of government restrictions, you go, holy crap. Look at what's right around the corner. Automated, localized food production, energy independence through solar, transportation, you know, uh, with, without reliance on the oil and gas industry or any infrastructure even with flying, uh, or self-flying uh, electric cars, essentially, with drones. I mean, this is all stuff that is right around the corner. And you remember my graph with like the two divergent lines, like this is where we could be, this is where we are, things are still getting better. That gap in between, it's the the, the the elites, they have these technologies, they have this higher quality of life, and the rest of us are being denied that because we're basically being forced through wage slavery and other government controls to work for the elites. All right, so should we skip the happiness segment? I wanted to cover this four in 10 adults Globally, living with a gastrointestinal disorder. The next one I found today to pair with that was smile for your stomach. Happiness may guard against deadly gut infections. And then I wanted to get into doom scrolling, negative thinking with dementia. But then there was another one, how to live to 100 and enjoy it. Yes, diet and exercise do matter. But as scientists are only just realizing, friendships can add years to your life too. I think all of these subjects deserve uh, another show. We'll come up with another title with happiness in it for tomorrow. So to wrap things up with our last 10 minutes, let's go to comments and see if we can get one of our backstage access guests up here on screen. Yeah, CJ, very held back there. Nick, is, is it, he goes by Nicholas, right? It, Nicholas. It, yeah, sorry. Nicholas is one of those names. There's like, Nick, you know, you yeah, yeah. put his name down as Nicholas, call him Nicholas, you know? Fair yeah. enough. You got me. Nicholas Barry Hill. So CJ. It means people of victory. There What's he up? is. Hello, Nick. Hey, Just how kidding, you doing? Nicholas. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. Good to finally talk to you again. It's been a while. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate you being here and hanging out backstage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's, on, what's on your mind today? 
Nothing. Just wanted to say hey to everybody. Tell them to join the Patreon. It's neat being able to be backstage, hang out with everybody. It feels like you're part of the production. Um, contribute to the good work you're doing. CJ, Adam, yes. they do a great job. Check out thefreedomline.com. Well, shit, man. Now we don't have to do our end of show promos. Like, it's like, we got, I got 10 minutes to kill. Am I supposed to go back to talking about happiness? Um, Nicholas. Yeah, so we all need a little more happiness. <laughs> well, maybe we'll do that. But let, let me, let me ask you a question, you know, of, of this production, um, you know, what, what do you like and, and what do you want to see us build out more of in bringing you, you know, the ultimate daily alternative new show that you know gives you a fun comprehensive worldview like we're trying to do with adam versus the man how can we make this better for you um i would say you're doing a good job right now with just covering stuff that you know putting a different lens on it than what the mainstream media is doing you know um giving people some different insight into what the events are that are actually going on and getting them to think you know like hey you know, this has all been manipulated to set you up to upset public opinion, uh, get people driven out to the polls, so to speak, because that's what both sides are doing. They're trying to mobilize their base. So don't fall for the trap. So I think you're doing a good job of exposing yep. that. Um, awesome. But I would like yeah. to see more, you know, you know, libertarian activism um, with the election coming around. we got to get in there and, and make sure we can get Joe Jorgensen as many votes as possible, you know. Donate yep. to her campaign. Make sure she's got the resources she needs to get the message out to uh to bring the message of liberty to everybody. On yeah, a more wider platform. That, yeah, Nicholas, if I may about that, and I I don't know if, I think I I was thinking about this when I interviewed her yesterday and did my opener about you know the importance of you know at, at very least in a sort of nominal way supporting Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen. Like at very <laughs> least, you know, change your social media profiles. To have a right. friend, it's the it's the new equivalent of putting out a yard sign, right? Yep. Put it on your. Phone. And what I what I think is really critical, and I think a very reasonable goal for us as a movement to achieve is to make sure that Joe Jorgensen builds on Gary Johnson's vote count. Yeah, we we three point two eight percent. Yep. Yeah, and that's that's a very reasonable goal. I mean, of course. We, we were running her to win. And I, I think she's a credible candidate. We can run to win and say she would be a better president. No questions asked. And I think we should be running to have, uh, you know, with a strategy to make sure that we have a breakout year for the Libertarian Party. Of course, that was the basis of my campaign, making sure that, to, and to me, a breakout would be clearing, clearing 10%. For a lot, that's a high goal. For a lot of people, right. a breakout year would be clearing five percent, going up from right. three and a quarter, building on that. Um, but I, I think if we, if, as a very reasonable goal, if we can just make sure, and this is like a fallback goal, I think our medium goal should be have a breakout year. Should be our, our medium goal should be get her to ten percent. Let's get Joe to ten percent. Holy mm. crap! How amazing would that be for the movement, for the party, for the cause going forward? Can we get Joe? But as a fallback goal. We got to beat 3.28. And right. uh, I, I think every asking everybody, every show, I got no problem, man. You want to bring it up as a reminder. Hey, get your uh, Facebook profile picture. Get that frame added for Jorgensen Cohen. Get everybody you can to do the same thing. And, you know, whatever you can do that that is, is you know, lending your social media voice, your platform mm -hmm. that they got you know, to, to the campaign. You know, let's help spread the word, make sure that the final score comes in where we want it. Thank you, Nicholas. Yeah, absolutely. And I like to see more behind the scenes stuff, too. That's pretty cool there at the garden with everything going on, the, the big igloos and things. So seeing more of that, you know, provides like insight what you guys are doing out there if you're homestead and and really gives people insight into an alternative way of life that is really possible if they want to pursue it. Awesome. Thank you for the reminder. Can do it. Yeah, we, we made it. Yeah, I mean, if this idiot can do it. Yeah, so we made it through. I made it that through. Way, <laughs> no, no, but that, no I, no, I appreciate that. And that is a big point of what we're doing here to show that, yeah, anybody can do it. You know, you want to live differently, take charge of your life, design your lifestyle from the ground up. Do you want to live in a city? Do you want to live rurally? What do you want to do for work? You know, what do you want to do for food? What do you want to do for shelter? Uh, like, and, and to be able to rethink all of these things from the ground up to live deliberately based on your values. Absolutely. 
Critical. And we made it through the show all the way to this point without mentioning you got to follow us on Instagram. These are the two hot ways of keeping up with the Garden of Freedom and Big Igloo Geodesics. Really easy to find on that platform. Looking for the Garden of Freedom and Big Igloo Geodesics. We got our caretaker, I guess, big announcement today about the Garden of Freedom. We officially have the Yaples. Uh, you might know them as the Yeeples, as their name is, you know, phonetically pronounced. It looks like Yeeples. Um, actually, it looks like Yapples. Yeah. Y-E-A. Yeah, it's Y-E-A-P-L-E-S. You might know them as our national uh, delegate team for, from the campaign. And they are going to be here for at least the next year as the caretakers of this property. And so it gives us a lot more flexibility in what we can do here, building out the website, um, the Garden of Freedom uh, Facebook page, excuse me, and Instagram and all that. So if you're interested in coming out, send me an email, adam at thefreedomline.com. We want to encourage people to come visit to see what we're doing here and to consider, uh, you know, living here for, you know, a not not permanently, but, you know, for an extended period, you know, six months to a year kind of time frame or even a few months. You know, we're open to working with people for whatever y'all might want for your experience to get the most out of this and hopefully help you transition to living more consciously and deliberately as well. So thank you, Nicholas, for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And are you, are you going to be at the convention in Orlando for the campaign rally? If, if there is one there, we will be there. And, you know, we have it the easiest with our planning. And we got the bus, me and Sam and, and uh, Comment Jim Freedom going to be joining us, I hope, for that, going down to Orlando. Um, and we get to sleep in the bus and just, you know, a couple of people uh, can even join us for a few days. But, you know, I'm I'm. I'm still, you know, and in, in, in our interview yesterday, Joe asked if we were going to be there. Like, yeah, if we can. Yeah, absolutely. We will be there. Uh, I'm, you know, with the way things are going and it's as much within the party as within the government and George Floyd and Corona concerns still. And like we're seeing, you know, I didn't cover it today, but I saw the headline on Drudge that there's a summer surge of corona cases and it's like well you know, i'll wait till it's at the point of overwhelming undeniable propaganda that is actually yeah. used to promote more shutdown policy but we might you know and it's scary to think uh that, that they could shut us down or that people within the party um, and I'm not going to open that can of worms might want us to get shut down but anyway nick yes and I, and I where are you where do you live I live in North Carolina. North Carolina. Do you mind going by Nick or are you deliberately Nicholas? Whatever. I just use Nicholas right. professionally because I need so. Uh, all right. So easy drive from North Carolina to Orlando. Yeah. Yep. And um, yeah, I hope to see you there. And, and, and I hope it goes through and, and ends up being a big thing. If it was up to me, and I, and I, you know, I, I don't want to overstep my bounds and try to like take charge of the national convention because, you know, we have national leadership elected and, and, and hired for that, although there is a lot of controversy with that right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it was up to me, it would be like, yes, we're, we would never have had a virtual convention in the first place. It'd be like, oh, we're defiant of all this nonsense. If you can defy this for a hair salon, damn right, we can defy this <laughs> for a political convention. Or, you know, explicit First Amendment rights. You know, anyway. So, Nicholas, any, any last thoughts? No, just keep up the good work. Love everybody. Join the Patreon. We'll see you backstage. Telegram. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks, Nick. All right. Any last comments from the uh, the gallery, Mr. Freedom? Any more? We started out strong with super chats. No more super chats at yeah, the end of the show. No one's, no one's trying to get a. Everybody's busy debating each other in the. Is that what's that? What? Are, anytime we talk about like the the racism issues, like someone's. And it's, it's great. Like, I'm glad that these conversations are happening. And it might be that we do a two hour show of all of this amazing, enlightening content. And the most transformational experience that comes out of it is someone in the comments dropping their racism or status bias or, you know, something like that. Because, you know, we allow these great contested great. conversations. Just a dollar for you. All right, Draco Chainmail just wants us to know that he's he's watching today and he's chipping in a dollar. So, you know, maybe this is a little sneak preview. I'm going to work in a, a book promo here for the one book, um, Freedom, because chapter nine here 
is called true personal freedom. And the first section is emotional slavery. And then we have two sections that are a little more uh, pedestrian, health freedom, you know, all the ways that you know, waking up makes you more uh, capable of making health decisions by thinking for yourself and, and trusting the right authorities rather than the wrong authorities. And work freedom, which is really about, you know, designing your your economic life so that especially around work, you're not materially contributing to something that is bad for the world, bad for your own happiness. But then the last section is the one I'm, I'm, I'm most proud of. And this is the one I started writing when I was in jail called Happiness Causes Freedom. And, you know, we've had some requests, Adam, you should do like book club story time and, you know, read a section of your book. Uh, you know, every day on the show, like no one even said you should read a section to start your show every day. And, you know, like maybe even today, if I don't, if I didn't have an idea for an opening monologue. I mean, I could just wrap on a paragraph. Like there, any paragraph out of here, they're all so dense and, and beautiful because I had so much help with this that, you know, we, we really could have fun with that. So if people have ideas, if people have requests, check it out. But if you haven't read it yet, get it. Freedom, it's free in every digital format possible at the Freedom Line. Dot com. CJ's so hot on all the promotions right now. It's amazing. Um, if you everybody again requests and and really, it's it's from we follow the money. We do what the money tells us to do. If you're in our uh, Patreon, uh, a patron only Telegram group chat, and you want to help contribute to the development of the show and subject or topics or you want me to read certain things or play certain videos or whatever it is or like nicholas said well nicholas actually asked for the you know more behind the scenes stuff and that's hey that's patron only but for a dollar just a dollar a month and i guess it's worth pointing out that a lot like about half the behind the some of the behind the scenes stuff is hey you can see adam in his shorts or sweatpants while he's doing the show in a dress shirt you know, and it's fun, you know, Adam versus the man behind the scenes, stuff like that. But most of it, I think, is is Garden of Freedom stuff. It's kind of like this unwritten thing where you sign up for the Adam versus the man Patreon. But really, one of the big perks is the Garden of Freedom behind the scenes footage. So there's we're going to keep some of that behind that paywall. And for a dollar a month, you can get uh, all that stuff from Jim. Hopefully five dollars a month. Join our Telegram group. And with that being said, well, you know, I almost, so I have like different sign offs, right? As long as we're in a casual show, we're only two minutes late today signing off. Um, I used to end all my shows with cool, huh? Oh, like, yeah. hey, I'm looking at the world. Cool, huh? <laughs> like, right? A nice little casual sign off. And I like, I like saying, well, you know, peace and love. And, but, you know, I, I think there's a, maybe, it be, see, this should be, this will be, remind me tomorrow. This will be our win a free membership to the Telegram chat. If you come up with the best sign off, because Elijah, our campaign manager, my good friend from Rhode Island, signs off every one of our uh, our team conference calls with "Be excellent to each other." I for, is that from something? Super chat. Oh, we got another super chat. End statism, twenty dollars chipping in, making our day. Not even a message. At the last minute, no message. Thank you very well. The message is and the statism. name. End statism. Yeah, yeah. We're on it. We're on it. That is awesome. Thank you so much. So I, I really like uh, be excellent to each other as a way of rem giving people like a positive reminder that that comes from you know the message of freedom. That, that's loving and encouraging of, of positive relationships and interactions. So be excellent to each other. For now, again, mwah, peace and love, y'all. We'll talk to you tomorrow.